bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't care. I don't I never have, and I never will. Yeah, right. I bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners, and I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Payne Insider and Todd Furman. Welcome into the Bet the Board podcast, NFL Week 14. We are officially entering the fourth quarter of the season. Still so much to be decided as playoff races heat up in both the AFC and the NFC. I am your host, Todd Furman, joined as always by my esteemed colleague and co-host, the one, the only, Payne Insider. And Payne, we made our listeners live dangerously a week ago, but the Carolina Panthers found a way to sneak in the back door, and I will never say anything negative about Bryce Young, at least for another week. Yeah, let's uh, try to make it two in a row here. Okay. A little, a little, going a little run here it's... to end the season. Would be nice. It'd be nice if we catch a little... Uh little fortune, although Monday night did not necessarily go our way late <laughs> again. I think at this point we should just swear off Jaguars games in any capacity. I mean, it doesn't matter side, total, for, against. Uh, they have been the bane of our existence going back to the beginning of last year when it, or maybe even further than that, when you look at some of the survivor knockouts that all seem to come against the Houston Texans. Yeah, so I knew we broke that game down on on Monday's show and kind of insinuated that we thought there was some value on the Bengals at at, at plus ten, and God forbid if it got to ten and a half, which it did at a few shops, but ultimately it chose not to to middle the last leg of the teaser, and it, it came back to bite us with five different starters getting injured for the Jaguars and and Jake Browning looking like a, a better version of of Joe Burrow, and still there you are. Under five minutes to go, first and ten from from inside the the Bengals green zone, and all hell breaks loose. You can't close out a teaser, and, and what would be like a plus three position week turns into uh, barely barely a singular position, and that is that is the 2023 football season. In a it show. has definitely been the encapsulation of everything. I want to thank all the listeners, by the way, for the positive feedback when we veered from the normal course of operating procedure on Monday to talk a little college football playoff. So glad you guys and girls out there appreciated it as we felt we had to provide a little bit more nuanced perspective on things than what you were going to get from the mainstream media celebrating some of the blue bloods. And we'll see how the aftermath of that impacts a couple of the bowl games going forward. But without further ado, we have a bar Barn burner, and I mean an absolute electric barn burner on tap for Thursday night football on Amazon Prime Pain between two proud franchises, albeit one that's reeling in terms of where they're going to be drafting this offseason and another trying to figure out their identity as they continue to push for the AFC playoffs. It's the Pittsburgh Steelers, a six-point favorite total on the game 30 as they'll welcome in the New England Patriots. And the last time the Patriots faced the Steelers while being multiple games under 500, it was way back in 19. 19- It was a head coaching matchup of Bill Cowher going up against Bill Parcells. The Patriots and Steelers also on track to be the first game with a closing total under 31 points since the Steelers-Bears did it back in 2005. In a snowstorm, it was Jerome Bettis rushing for more than 100 yards and a pair of touchdowns. The Patriots, they've lost 10-plus games in a season for the first time since 2000. They went 22 straight seasons without losing 10-plus games, tied for the longest streak in the Super Bowl era. And when we look at the Steelers, they are at NFL best 10-2 and to the under this year. The Patriots, meanwhile, NFL worse, going 2-10 and 10 ATS. Payne, it is extremely difficult in this day and age that you allow your opponent six points in a football game and still can't cover, but that's what the Patriots did last weekend. When you look at the different dynamics in play tonight, Bailey Zappi going to get the nod for the Patriots. Mitchell Trubisky on the other side. The Patriots defense, despite offensive ineptitude, still out there fighting, scratching, clawing for everything. Steelers defense, we've talked about them being a bit of a paper tiger. Which matchup are you most intrigued to watch tonight? Under the bright lights at a cruiser field well it was a good thing we we were fortunate and quit the patriots last week other pro betters they can't quit them can't quit them couldn't rid themselves of that bad habit i guess if you caught the peak price of plus six you pushed any other number was a loser despite only giving up six points to the chargers which is just unfathomable to think about again this week uh 
a couple factions that garner market respect grab the Patriots plus six and a half I get the vibe we're trending below the six here if you can believe it and New England's gonna have to at least score this week so I think talking Bailey Zappi and the Patriots offense makes sense and you watch Zappi and and he's limited right the arm strength isn't great early on last week he was extremely slow to process the accuracy was downright atrocious and I know there was some weather but 27 percent below expectation and completion rate Zappi was substantially better though in the second half and so your thought process there is you know potentially gain some confidence you can take some of those those positives and move them forward here uh, against the Steelers now Ramondre Stevenson out so it's it's Zeke Elliott I don't know how his body responds on a short week and I think Stevenson is certainly more versatile and fits the system a little bit better and then when you do drop off to RB2 that's probably going to be a little bit larger of a, a dip but it, it's crazy if you just look at Ramondre and, and Zeke this season on an Excel sheet they're the same exact back in terms of explosiveness and success rate. So um, perceptually, visually, it looks like a massive drop off. Efficiency wise, it, it might not be, but but we'll see. Patriots offensive line has to be much better. I mean, Zappy was pressured on 37% of his dropbacks last week, which is above average league rate against a Chargers defense that's 29th in pass rush win rate and was without Joey Bosa. Now you get an above average unit uh, with that Steelers front of, of TJ Watt and, and Hayward now healthy, Highsmith, Ogan Joby. So that could be a real problem for Zappy. I think what you'll see in the throw game here is, is a quick release short and intermediate kind of pass attack with crossers from the Patriots lots of picks and rubs because the Steelers have upped their rate of man coverage this season fourth highest rate in the NFL so those types of routes will work best linebacker position is is quite poor for Pittsburgh and and has been decimated by injury Minka Fitzpatrick is is back but broke his hand last week so you need to be able to attack the middle of the field get Hunter Henry and the tight ends going if you look at the Steelers um you really want to get those backers just in coverage, forced to defend the middle of the field. The Cardinals tight ends went for 11 receptions for 120 yards last week. Heavy formations really give the Steelers some trouble as well. And the Patriots use that because they have a, a pretty lackluster receiver group. So you've seen them use more two tight end sets, which has been kind of the way you want to attack the the, the Steelers defense uh, there's just not a lot of athletes or playmakers on the Patriots offense so everything is just a grind everything's an uphill battle and then you sprinkle in the turnover woes and it's it's made this unit just just piss poor if Douglas returns from his concussion that would be huge but basically we outlined the path to attacking the Steelers defense the margins are are paper thin but you got to use some crossers. You got to attack the linebackers with your tight ends. If New England can get into the low teens, right, thirteen, something like that, <laughs> that's how betters who who can't quit the Patriots are, are going to potentially cover this. Number. I mean, look, their team total is twelve and a half for a reason. When we look at the Patriots, they average twelve point three points per game. It's the worst in the NFL and on pace to be the worst scoring offense since the two thousand eleven Rams. Uh, but for all those folks that are wearing the black and gold goggles out there, I mean, look, the Steelers are only averaging sixteen points per game. It's the fewest points per game by a team with a winning record through 12 games since the 1992 Broncos. And spoiler alert, those Broncos would actually go on and miss the postseason. So for Steelers fans that are already making their plans for the middle of January and a potential playoff game, you might need a little bit more firepower. Najee Harris was upgraded earlier this morning despite not being in practice all week long. He should go. I thought his comments were absolutely priceless when asked by a reporter about Mitchell Trubisky and his leadership pain. It's kind of lukewarm, to say the least, going, he's a vocal mm-hmm. he's a vocal leader, so Lord only knows what we're going to get today uh, from the Steelers and Patriots, but it kicks off the week. Two proud franchises, one fighting for their playoff lives. The other may be benefiting immensely from losing out and drafting a franchise quarterback uh, at the top of the draft. But from 17-13, get you home for for the Patriots you know and and I we talk all the time about roles Pittsburgh's best role is typically underdog 
everyone against them, right? Using that motivation and, you know, laying points typically is, is not the role as we saw last week, unfortunately. Well, and we, and the interesting part about last week, and it's the things that we all know go on with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And the fact that the players actually verbalized them was a little bit scary. It, whether it was Jalen Warren or Deontay Johnson coming out and saying, yep, we may have underestimated the Cardinals, look past them, whatever terminology you want to use. Wasn't quite sure the Steelers had that luxury at a 7-4 and four record, but you saw it on full display when the Arizona Cardinals took their heart and soul in a 99-yard marathon march right before the half in a game that had about 37 weather delays. So we'll see exactly what we have tonight with the Steelers, nearly a touchdown favorite in this spot. Uh, into Sunday, pain, and this game would have had all the intrigue. It loses a little bit of its luster, at least for now. We're going to want to monitor the injury report for the Jaguars traveling north to take on the Cleveland Browns. Jacksonville off a short week having played on Monday night against another AFC North opponent. We've seen this one, you know, jump to zero. Jaguars would have been a two and a half, three point road favorite with a healthy Trevor Lawrence. We're looking at Cleveland right around a field goal favorite juiced heading towards three and a half total on this game. A little bit of weather, a little bit of quarterback uncertainty. We're now down to 30 and a half throughout the market. I think the big question is, will this total dip below what we're going to see on Thursday night football? And it's actually the first Jaguars Browns meeting in franchise history for these teams were both enter above 500 the 19th overall meeting obviously no reason to bury the lead in any capacity pain Trevor Lawrence we saw the press conference we know he hasn't missed a game due to injury in high school college or the NFL market says he's not going to play do we think the Jaguars rush him back or they give him a week to rest up and recover dealing with that high ankle sprain yeah if I had the answers to that, um, we'd be moving quietly plus three uh, yeah, even money off the screen. You know, it's 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 like against my religion. Like it's against my my inner fiber here because you don't want to tip your hand too early, and limits are so low and not widely available. But personally speaking, here, uh, Todd, I probably should spend a little more time next season getting down on look aheads. Browns plus three got crushed right before kick Monday night. And then a combination of the Jaguars getting absolutely ravaged by injury, specifically Trevor Lawrence, and then Jake Browning having you know this anomaly effort looking like Tom Brady in his prime has, has influenced this six-point move. There's probably a couple things to think about, and, and most of it is is injury, style of play in this particular setting, and then some, some misleading results. So Trevor Lawrence has the high ankle sprain, rolled into the presser yesterday, in sandals and without a boot. <laughs> I know the guy is Gumby, but this would be wild to go from high ankle sprain to playing in in six days and cold weather, which makes it even more difficult on on injuries, right? And then you're potentially throwing him out there with what? A third string left tackle? You also have to remember Walker Little the Jaguars' backup left tackle was also injured on the same exact play with a hamstring injury that, that Trevor Lawrence was injured on. So, I mean, Jacksonville could potentially have a situation where if Trevor Lawrence tries to go and is immobile, you got a third-string left tackle protecting his blind side against a Browns defense fourth and pass rush win rate. You also look at the Browns' defensive home road splits. I can't tell you how or why it's happening. It's incredible. Yeah, I mean, clearly the Browns feel more comfortable at home. And I know a lot of people thought it was schedule-induced early on in the season, but you look at the schedule of opponent, it's not all that different. The Browns have faced offenses with an average efficiency rank of 14th at home, 13th on the road. But the delta in EPA, success, and points allowed is, is massive. Now the Browns' defense back at home, all signs are pointing towards their lead corner, Denzel Ward returning as well. And then the weather should impact this game. And and that's kind of what I meant about the setting. As it stands right now, Thursday morning, you're looking at wind and rain and this time of year lake effect that's very difficult to capture in any of the public weather models. And the Jaguars' ground game has struggled. Travis Entian is also battling a core injury. You saw DeErnest Johnson uh, you know, get a bunch of carries late in that game. Jaguars' ground game has struggled. If it's C.J. Beathard, <laughs> he's he struggled at times with arm strength, right? Short passes are kind of feathered too often to the outside. Deep ball can be wobbly. You think about C.J. Beathard in 
a genius offense led by Kyle Shanahan designed to make quarterbacks look better than they actually are. Beathard only completed 58% of his passes and went 2-10 and 10 in his 12 starts for the 49ers. One thing you can say about Joe Flacco, even at age 38, is the arm strength is still there. The guy just has a freaking arm cannon. We saw it last week. The Browns have also faced, to me, uh, a, a much difficult schedule right browns have faced um you know a top five schedule of run defenses so i think they're going to have a little bit more efficiency on the ground as well and so when you're thinking about you know if the winds are high if there's gusts you, you want the quarterback with the stronger arm you want the run game that's a little bit more efficient we also saw the jaguars run defense fall off a cliff in in the Bengals game early on when their horse inside fatakowski left with with a, a heel injury so, you know, it wasn't just the obvious of Trevor Lawrence going down, but you started to see some some injuries on defense, right? Your starting slot corner, Trey Herndon, left the Bengals game two plays in with a concussion. I would envision, you know, in a short week, it's it's tougher to clear the concussion protocol, although it seems as the games have gotten a little bit more important. And oh, yeah, it's a little, it's a lot, from more, the Tua thing. a lot more lenient uh, this yeah. time of the year than it was early in the season. <laughs> Apparently, recovery from a concussion in September takes 10 to 14 days. Recovery from a concussion in November and December takes 72 hours. Yeah, guys are, are returning quicker, but, you know, you're starting to, like, just pile these things up. I mean... You lose your horse and run stopper in the middle. You lose your 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 starting slot corner. Your quarterback's down. Your left tackle's down. Your running back's like just going through injury. So like the Jaguars are a little bit beat up here. The style of defense the Browns play is lots of tight man coverage. Christian Kirk is the Jaguars' best man cover beater on crossers and rubs. He's out. And then when I think about misleading results, you know the Browns have had two. Um, in consecutive weeks, right? They, they missed a point after that would have tied the game at 20-20 with eight minutes to go in the fourth quarter against the Rams. It's still a one-point game with under five minutes to go, yet the final score looks like a 17-point blowout. Mm-hmm. The week prior, right? It's 14-12 in Denver. You battled back, and then DTR gets injured, so we have to experience P.J. Walker all over again, and, and the game's dead at that point. So there's there's a lot of factors in Cleveland's favor. We've seen some very sharp bettors who didn't get the look-ahead number still be willing to lay minus 160 on the money line. It'll look great if Trevor is out. If Trevor's in and he's going at like 60% in that weather with a third string left tackle, a beat up running back, there's still guys out, right, with Kirk and potentially some guys on defense. You probably won't beat the closing line, so there's not going to be a lot of value, but I don't think that bet is even dead. So you kind of go through the whole asymmetric risk mindset there. How do you think the Browns quarterback situation plays out from here down the stretch? Is it Joe Flacco, regardless of DTR clear concussion protocol? Yeah, okay. has to be. That's uh, I was. L- I mean, he did he not look good last no, week? No, he did. I mean, and he was stretching yeah. the field. There, I mean, they yeah. were looking to throw deep and try and take advantage. He had one bad pass, and unfortunately, it got returned, and the Rams were able to cash it in uh, for seven to take a twenty to nineteen lead and, out to twenty seven nineteen. And you hope that with that deep passing game, it starts to open up the run game a little bit more, right? Because you you can't. You can't cheat. I mean, basically, DTR was was having him play in a phone booth. And so not only is the pass game a little bit more efficient, but if you're willing to push the ball down the field a little bit more, uh, it, it should be able to open up the the, 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 the run game for, for Ford and company. So, yeah, I think, I think the reason you go and get Joe Flacco isn't for him to be a backup. Um, yeah. Take. I mean, to me, when I look at the efficiency numbers, when I look at our power ratings, it is it's not like a massive boost, but it's it's certainly a boost, right? It's a professional. It's a veteran in that locker room. It's a guy where the defense can kind of look around and be like, OK, this guy can make some plays and it's not going to be on us every single game. It's a fair way to look at it. Uh, and I'm sure Jets fans wonder what it'd be like if they had Joe Flacco on their roster under center. <laughs> cough, cough, wink, wink, nod, nod. Rams. Yeah, I mean, even if you think he's one point below an average quarterback or one and a half points below an average quarterback, I mean, Tim Boyle, like, I mean, you, you saw. Tim, oh, Tim we Boyle saw enough released. of Tim Boyle and we right. saw enough of Trevor Simeon <laughs> right. in limited sample size. Yeah. I mean, those guys are, are four, four and a half points below an average quarterback. 
There is uh, no doubt about it that sometimes it helps to have an adult in the room, and we'll see if Joe Flacco can provide that stabilizing influence for the Cleveland Browns. Speaking of Joe Flacco and his former team, the Baltimore Ravens, fresh off a bye, will welcome in the Los Angeles Rams. And it's the Ravens, depending on where you look, as low as a seven-point favorite. We'll call the consensus seven and a half on this contest. Total on the game sits at 40. It's down from the open as high as 44 and a half. And when you look at the Ravens off the bye, nine and three so far this season, they're tied for the best record in the AFC with the Dolphins. Miami currently owns the tiebreaker in that regard, but the Ravens have their work cut out for them down the stretch. One of the hardest remaining strength to schedules in the NFL. If you look at an opponent's win-loss record, they'll play the Rams. They'll go to Jacksonville next week for Sunday Night Football. Game obviously a heck of a lot different if there's no Trevor Lawrence. At the 49ers, home against the Dolphins and home against the Steelers. Under Coach Harbaugh, the Ravens have been dominant. Following a bye week since 2008, they're 12-3 and three after a bye, scoring at least 24 points 10 times. They've also given up 14 or fewer points 7 times in those 15 games. Uh, and to a man, when you read some of the player comments, the Ravens said the bye came at the perfect time after playing 12 consecutive games. You like a late bye if you're 9-3. and three. You don't like a late bye necessarily if you're 3-9, and nine, but this gives the Ravens a chance to hit the refresh button as they try and come down the stretch. They'll have to be better in closing out games. It's a team that leads the NFL in point differential through the first three quarters, but they're outside the top 20 when you look at fourth quarter scoring differential. The Ravens historically, though, they have struggled in this kind of role. Just 1-8 and eight ATS is more than a touchdown favorite going back to 2021. But Payne, when we look at this Rams team, I mean, this is yet another t- chance for them coming off a bye, taking on an opponent. They've already played the Steelers and Cowboys. Both of those resulted in losses. The Rams off Offense got humming last week against the Cleveland Browns. I know we talked about the Browns splits between home and road, but this feels like a completely different animal for Matthew Stafford and company to go out and attack, knowing how the Ravens want to pin their ears back. And you look at a lot of the defensive metrics that we've seen from Baltimore. They have been outstanding all season long. You you kind of referenced that Browns game there, and it feels like this has a lot of shades that are very similar in terms of matchups, you know, style of play in the elements and then, you know, misleading final scores all pointing one way as well. And, you know, as, as we record this, we're looking at wind gusts exceeding 30 miles per hour with heavy rain in Baltimore for Sunday. And if that's the scenario at its very basic core, you propose the question, do you want the physical East Coast team that plays in weather conditions more often with the most efficient run defense and the most efficient run offense with a mobile quarterback that allows you to play 11 on 11 or the West Coast Dome team with a pocket statue and a below average run defense. And so I think the well, weather... Well, you put it that way. <laughs> I think the weather likely enhances Baltimore's edge than if the game was played straight and true. And, you know, the last time we, we saw Baltimore, like they looked pretty lethargic in primetime against the Chargers, still managed to get there. And, and you mentioned it now, the late season buy enters the fold, and those are very advantageous for teams. Um, you also think about something we've referenced a couple times this season with the Ravens is, is Lamar Jackson's just such a different look that these NFC teams seem to have struggle, uh, you know, some struggles defending him. But you also look at, at what the Rams have done recently, and that's kind of where I'm going with market perception is they've won three straight. And I think that initially helped depress this price. But we know two of the three outcomes aren't necessarily what transpired on the field. We just finished talking about the last data point where the Browns are a missed PAT from being tied at 20 with under five minutes to go against the Rams. That game ends in a 17 point blowout. The first bookend in the three game winning streak is at home against Seattle. I don't want to talk about it. mightily. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> but the Rams are down 13 nothing. And then they're trailing by two scores with under eight minutes to go in the game. Geno Smith is is out with an injury. Jason Myers misses a field goal at the buzzer. The one great data point in this three-game win streak for the Rams against a bottom seven Cardinals team. And the matchup is fantastic as the Cardinals plays off, you know, soft zone coverage and play it poorly. And Matthew Stafford feasts on zone. So, you know, I think with two weeks to prepare. We get a Ravens defensive coordinator and Mike McDonald likely going with the right game plan and upping his rate of man coverage in this setting. The Ravens have just been, you know, very diverse in their coverages this season. But the very reason McDonald has been one of the best in his short time in the NFL is his ability to mold his defense to an opponent. 
And with two weeks repair, I think that happens. Whereas, you know, Wink would just throw his hands up and say, I do what I do. Now beat us. That's been the material change Baltimore wanted internally. It's come to fruition uh, under Mike McDonald. I, I really like the Ravens in some advantage teasers this week, Todd. Makes a ton of sense. Look, this is a team that we've seen limp to the finish because they didn't have a healthy Lamar Jackson. We'll see if this year looks a little bit different, but everything in front of the Ravens to be the number one seed in the AFC, they're going to have to go out there and earn it, and I think it starts this week against a Rams team that, to the surprise of a lot of folks, sits at 500 through their first 12 games of the season in control of their own playoff destiny, Uh, and you mentioned some of those results. I mean, the Rams have six wins. Four of those wins have come at the expense of the Arizona Cardinals and the Seattle Seahawks so far this season. So six wins, but you've beaten four teams all year long. We'll see exactly how this game unfolds in the elements Saturday early afternoon in Baltimore. Uh, On the West Coast, pain, the NFC West can be won essentially closed out for the most part by the 49ers with the final death blow to the Seattle Seahawks. And the 49ers, fresh off of their drubbing of the Philadelphia Eagles last week and find themselves double-digit favorites in this spot. Uh, 10 and a half point chalk. We're down a touch though from where this number opened as high as 12 and a half on the reopen on Monday. Total on this game 46 and a half, the consensus across the market. And when we look at the 49ers, since their bye week, they're 4 0 and they've outscored teams 134 to 49. They're 4 0 against the Seahawks over the last two seasons, outscoring the Seahawks 120 to 56. The most recent data point, of course, coming on Thanksgiving where they beat Seattle 31 to 13. And we look at this. 49ers team. They're 16-0 and with a healthy Brock Purdy, Christian McCaffrey, and Debo Samuel, including playoff games. They've outscored their opposition 529-239. to Meanwhile, when we look at the Seahawks, they lost to the Cowboys and made history last Thursday night. They were the first team in league history to lose, scoring 35-plus points and never punting. That does come with a caveat. The reason they didn't punt, they were short on downs, not once, not twice, but three times on their final three series. And it was actually the first time losing after scoring 35 points since Pete Carroll took over as head coach. They'd previously been 36-0 and under Carroll in that role. 49ers, 14-1 straight up, 12-2-1 ATS, last 15 games versus NFC opponents. They're 10-0 straight up, 9-0-1 ATS in their last 10 divisional games. The Seahawks, an absolute mash unit. But Payne, when you look at a game where these teams are going to run it back in a very short period of time, how will this cover be decided? Seahawks offense against the 49ers defense or the high-powered 49ers offense led by MVP favorite Brock Purdy against the Seahawks defense taking on water since the start of November? I mean, we, we broke this down, right, on, on Thanksgiving, and it was, what, two weeks ago? So not much has changed from then to now. Pete Carroll did come out and say he gave his guys a light work week leading up to Thanksgiving, and, and that didn't work out. So he's implemented tougher practices leading up to this 49ers game with the with the mini buy. I think if you're an NFL better that only focuses on spot and situation, you're thinking Seattle here. And there was a a pretty well-respected group that wiped out the 12 and a half Monday morning on Seattle. We were kind of hoping that got to 13. And the thought process is simple, right? Mini buy late in the season, quick turnaround revenge, and the 49ers can't possibly crank the volume up to 100 again this week after putting, you know, all their focus, effort, and energy into beating the Eagles last week. It was really the 49ers regular season Super Bowl. So that's kind of the two-minute handicap if you're if you're backing Seattle and it's typically been a a profitable strategy over the years but I I still don't think the matchup is great Shanahan has just found a way to scheme points up the Seahawks are are playing some iteration of zone coverage on more than 83 percent of their passing snaps this season and Brock Purdy is completing over 76 percent of his passes against zone coverage the one saving grace Seattle had in the first matchup and mind you, they still gave up 31, is they were able to pressure Brock Purdy. Clint Hurts sent blitz on 41% of his dropbacks. Purdy was under pressure on on 44% of his dropbacks in totality, and Purdy struggled under pressure. 58% adjusted accuracy, had a 63 passer rating with a turnover-worthy play. I would envision San Francisco being better prepared for Seattle's blitzes this time around, right? The types of blitzes, where the pressure's coming from. We know Debo is the zone beater. McCaffrey usually finds his way into the passing game against Seattle as well since they're they're poor defending running back passes. And Jordan Brooks, the speedy Seattle linebacker, is dealing with an ankle injury. They're saying it's not as severe as they initially thought, but I still don't think he goes here. Um 
I don't know what it is, but there's like far too much talent on Seattle's defense to be this poor. I mean, we're, we're talking bottom five in EPA per play and success rate surrendered since week nine. The injury report for Seattle isn't good. I mentioned Jordan Brooks, but Leonard Williams has not practiced yet. Apparently, he's got another injury. Trey Brown, Jamal Adams, he's also dealing with some issues. And I know Adams has kind of been in the news this week for some stupidity, but he also gets picked on a bunch. Typically, he moves to the linebacker role when Brooks is out. If both are out, then Kittle should show well here. Debo over the middle should show well here, especially against zone, right? McCaffrey getting into the pass game again. Since week nine, Seattle's also dead last 32nd in EPA per rush allowed. Not really what you want going up against a Kyle Shanahan type offense, which is one of the most sophisticated run games there are in the NFL. On the other side, you want to be able to to get your ground game going against the 49ers. And, and neither Walker or Charbonneau are practicing yet this week. And, and since the bye, the 49ers run defense is actually trended upwards, top five in EPA per rush allowed since week 10. So two run defenses heading in opposite directions. You know, Todd, this is kind of one of those games where, again, if you're just doing the two-minute handicap, you're on Seattle, no ifs, ands, or buts. Once you dig into the matchup, the injuries, the history between these two iterations of the team, kind of have some some reservations and pause. I know Gino is substantially healthier now than he was heading into that Thanksgiving game, but the 49ers closed seven and a half in that spot in one of the tougher road environments. We're now at basically like 10.25 and the venues changed. So you're not really getting a massive price bargain on Seattle here right now. No, as the numbers come down, I mean, any of the value that may have existed early in the week should this number have leaked out to 13, completely out of the equation. Uh, And to your point, the X's and O's don't truly support it. And quite frankly, what we've seen from Seattle, I'm not sure if their B game is good enough to beat, or even their A game, excuse me, is good enough to beat the 49ers B game. But we'll see exactly what the 49ers can do, how they handle a bit of prosperity against the team that they took care of, fresh off their biggest and most dominant performance of this season but the Niners everything in the world in front of them right now is they continue to build momentum for this postseason push uh, and that's why they've moved to the Super Bowl favorites at this point price is as short as three to one throughout the market you can follow Payne on Twitter uh, or X at Payne Insider I'm Todd Furman you can follow me there for all things bet the board follow the podcast at bet the board pod uh, and while it's still late in the season you can still subscribe to the bet the board podcast newsletter delivered to your inbox every Friday or Saturday to try and give you an additional advantage play to add to your weekend portfolio. All right, Payne, we've kind of lightly glossed over the first four games that are of the most intrigue and save the best two for last. Uh, And Sunday afternoon, the Bills and Chiefs will do battle. And clearly when this game was put on the schedule, we thought this could be for the number one seed in the AFC, not just one team fighting to get back on track and another fighting for its playoff lives. But here we are with the Chiefs, a one and a half point favorite at Arrowhead against Against the Bills, total up from as low as 47 where it opened into that 48 and a half, 49 range. And the last two meetings between these teams have come down to a difference of six points or less. The Chiefs, as things sit right now, currently the three seed in the AFC playoffs. Why is that relevant? Well, Patrick Mahomes has never played a road playoff game in his short, illustrious career. The Chiefs have also been the model of resilience, winning 10 straight games after a loss, the longest active streak in the NFL. Here are the Bills, though, coming into this game fresh off a of bye week, and they're 6-0 and off the bye week under Sean McDermott with a chance to move to 7-0 and against the Chiefs. McDermott, some pretty strong words about the things that they're able to do with self-scouting during the bye, figure out who they want to be down the stretch and how they can make some of those adjustments. What's interesting with this Bills team, though, they've really struggled in one-score games, going just 9-15 and in a 24-game sample size in that regard. But if they turn into blowouts, that's where the Bills are at their best, going 23-2. and These two quarterbacks spend some of the least amount of time on the turf of any in the league. Their mobility in the pocket has a lot to do with it, but they're the two teams with a sack rate allowed under 4%. And when you look at how prolific they've been in terms of accounting for touchdowns, either on the ground or through the air, there's a reason these two are some of the best in the league. So Payne, when we look at the Bills from an offensive standpoint, I mean, this is a group averaging 33 points per game since they fired Ken Dorsey. Josh Allen this year, seven games with at least three total touchdowns. We know he's been plagued by the turnover bug. James Cook trying to get going on the ground. We've seen the receiving core show a little bit more depth aside from Stephon Diggs. 
in steps a Kansas City defense, beaten and battered off of their worst performance from a points-per-game standpoint on Sunday Night Football against the Green Bay Packers. Spags against Joe Brady, who has the edge? Um, it's a good question. I I think I know what we're getting from the Bills offense in this spot off the bye. I'm also hoping if Dawson Knox returns, he doesn't ruin everything. And... I, I hate saying it like that, but we mentioned when Knox went down how it could be a a positive, that it would be addition by subtraction, and it would kind of force the Bills into their more efficient personnel groupings and open the offense up a bit. And So that is something to keep an eye on. I would envision Joe Brady with with thoughts from McDermott implemented, tries to fire up the ground game. You know, we're now looking at Chiefs defense, bottom five in schedule adjusted rush efficiency. Bill's offensive line has been a real pleasant surprise this season, top 10 in run block win rate. So you could absolutely see James Cook and Latavius Murray, you know, finding real success on the ground. Now, I think it's big. It appears that the green dot linebacker, Nick Bolton, will be able to return for the Chiefs. He's trending well. You mentioned some of those injuries starting to pile up in the middle of the field with guys like Bolton previously and Tranquil and and then Cook going down at safety. So if Nick Bolton is back, that'd be massive. I envision he'll play with some type of of cast on his his arm or wrist, but it'll be interesting to see how effective he is. But I just he's been that leader of the defense, as crazy as it sounds, even with Chris Jones a part of it. The other interesting part of this matchup is we know Spags loves to blitz. And so that's where the cat and mouse comes in between OC and and DC. If you look at the five previous matchups since twenty twenty. Josh Allen's pressure, no pressure delta is massive in these games. Spags has, has basically sent heat to Josh Allen on 34% of his dropbacks. When the pressure gets home, Allen is completing 24% less of his passes. When Allen isn't blitzed in the previous five meetings, um, his passing yards per attempt increase over four and a half yards. And so I bring this up because Spags right now is blitzing at the eighth highest rate on early downs this season. The blitz just isn't getting home. 29th highest pressure rate on those early down blitzes. Last two seasons when Spags was doing that, he was getting home at the fourth highest rate. And so it's left the Chiefs pass defense susceptible in recent weeks. You mentioned last week against Jordan Love. They blitzed Jordan Love 16 times, got home just three times. And Love just crushed Spags when he blitzed and didn't get home. The Bills offensive line is is not just improving in run blocking, but they're seventh in pass block win rate as well. So I think you're looking at advantages for the Bills offense on the ground. You're looking at a pass game for Buffalo that should find success if Spags continues to dial up blitz and not get home. I I think the Bills offense is able to do some things here in this spot, Todd. Do you think the Chiefs offense is able to find a path to success uh, given some of the struggles that we've seen in recent weeks from them? Isaiah Pacheco, outstanding performance against the Packers. Missed Wednesday's practice. Uh, I can't imagine he misses the game on Sunday. Rasheed Rice has emerged as the true number two weapon in the passing game behind Travis Kelsey. But other than those two, it's been rather difficult for Patrick Mahomes to be able to find targets that he can lean on. Uh, And when you look at some of the Chiefs' performances last week, I mean, credit to Green Bay Packers. They completely took the air out of the ball. The Chiefs had seven true drives in that game, and it magnifies any mistakes you make or opportunities that you let slip through your fingers where you settle for field goals instead of putting sevens out there. When we look at Mahomes from a passing yards per game so far this season, career low, yards per attempt, career low, two games with three-plus passing touchdowns. He's never had fewer than five in a season. Completing a high percentage of his passes, though, because he's looking a little bit shorter, and the interception number flirting with where he finished you know, throwing 13 back in 2021 this is a Bills defense pain that on the other side can get after the quarterback we know they've been a little bit vulnerable against the run giving up 4.6 yards per carry to opposing running backs if you're Kansas City trying to figure out the best way to attack Buffalo is it putting it all on Mahomes or is it trying to create some of that balance keeping that Bills pass rush at bay yeah I'm I'm more interested in seeing what McDermott comes up with off the bye I I think this is the test to figure out if we should expect defensive improvement down the stretch for Buffalo. You got the one game bump and then it was also a great spot, right? You held the Jets offense to a 28% success rate at home with you know, Wilson and Boyle. That just doesn't do anything for me. And then with all of the weather induced help against a struggling Eagles offense, 
Philly goes out, starts a little bit slow, but in that second half, just dominated, right? I mean, they were successful in 56% of their snaps in the second half, averaged 0.38 expected points per snap. So we really didn't get that that boost from Buffalo's defense that we saw, you know, against the Jets. The Chiefs offense is struggling relative to what their expectation is. They're battling some injuries. I think you have to keep an eye on the left tackle position. Donovan Smith left two times during the Packers game with a neck injury. It was bugging him during the Raiders game. Wanye Morris, the third round rookie, had to fill in there. He was actually very good against the Packers. Uh, you mentioned Isaiah Pacheco battling some injuries. Mahomes actually found himself on the injury report with a pec injury, but he did practice in full. Got to lay off the bench press, when, Patrick. Got to lay off the bench <laughs> press. In these spots, in games this large, Andy typically brings out the best stuff, right? You're, you're getting the A++ game plan. You're getting the A++ call sheet. I can't really figure out the Bills' run defense, to your point. It's been middling in terms of efficiency and EPA allowed. Sometimes those guys up front can overwhelm. Other times they're getting gashed, so it's it's vital Pacheco is healthy. And this is a big step up in class for the Bills' defense. right? They've faced the very easiest schedule of offenses this season. I know everyone believes Kelsey is slowing down some. That does appear to be the case, but he's still the guy you want to attack the Bills with. If you look at the last five matchups, again, 40 catches on 51 targets for 444 yards and six touchdowns. He's been that that dominant factor. You mentioned Rasheed Rice. He is really emerging. 19 targets the last two games. Route precipitation uh, participation is uh, 70% last week. Target share. Well, if you know if he is to- making a rain pain, pers- uh, precipitation <laughs> is apropos in that particular instance. Yes. Uh, if you look at the target share, it's been greater than 30% the last two games. So we know coming out of college that Rice was one of the very best zone beaters. McDermott likes to implement zone coverages. So I would think Rasheed Rice has to be a factor again this week. But you start to think about this game from both sides. You know, Bill's run game has has got going now that Cooks is getting 20-plus touches again the last two games. The Chiefs defense has regressed some in, in dealing with, with some injuries. Spags blitz isn't getting home. And, you know, again, that's one of the things that has caused Josh some trouble in these matchups. The Bills defense stepping up in class big time. Reed has had great success against McDermott. The weather looks substantially better where wind and, and rain won't impact it. And so that's why we've seen this total from, you know, shoot from 47 to as high as 49. But when I think about that, totals wise, there's just some variance here. Right, like if the Bills' ground game is working, you know, tick, 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 tick. If McDermott figures out his defense during the bye against a relatively struggling Chiefs offense, it presents some some questions, right? Like I agreed with the move at forty seven, but it's mostly predicated on matchup and prior history. Nobody on planet Earth who actually does this at a sophisticated level gets their core number to forty nine here, based upon this year's data points. Hey, look, it it makes sense. You're going to see, you would think the Bills at their absolute best, and they're going to need it because for all those Bills fans that are out there who see a path for this team to get to the playoffs, sure, you win games, you have an opportunity to get in, but it ain't going to be easy. At the Chiefs, home against the Cowboys, at the Chargers, home against the Patriots appears to be the layup, but that loss against the Patriots looks worse by each passing week, and then they'll finish up on the road at Miami, a place that can be very difficult to play. In uh, especially in January when the temperatures are in the 20s in western New York and you're sitting in the sweltering heat and humidity in the 80s if Miami has a track or an opportunity to get that number one seed in the AFC. So this will go a long way in terms of defining what we'll see from both these teams late in the campaign. And as we mentioned, three was available on Buffalo early in the week. That number was cleared out pretty quickly uh, on Monday morning. And you mentioned what we've seen with the total as well. Final... I think... Oh, God. I I think if you believe... Buffalo's coming out of this by saying, let's just fucking go, guys. Like, let's just do this, right? If they are fully entrenched on making this run, I know the schedule it's difficult, and the record and the schedule being difficult down the stretch is kind of what's providing some value in some of the futures markets. So there's a lot of sharp guys that I like this week that said, hey, like, we believe the Bills show up in this spot. Let's let's take a flyer on some Bills futures, some Josh Allen MVP stuff. Um, 
And if you believe that to be the case, right, there was prices upwards of, of like 50 to 1 to win the Super Bowl heading into this week. Uh, it kind of interesting knowing the pedigree knowing the talent uh is there and if you you know you get a win this week and a game that now is you know two one and a half two um which says you know they're they're pretty much equals on a neutral uh you can see why you know there were some guys that were gravitating towards some future prices on on the buffalo bills hey i mean if the bills get hot and win out suddenly uh they could be division champions in the afc east uh, clearly plenty of work to be done uh for that to potentially come to fruition but they'll play some of the big boys in front of them and they will earn it every step of the way if they're able to punch their ticket back to the postseason from sunday afternoon into a tremendous game on sunday night football pain to close things out the dallas cowboys will welcome in the philadelphia eagles and we've seen the cowboys on a look-ahead number, two-and-a-half-point favorites. Uh, they take care of business against the Seahawks. The Eagles stub their toe, to put it mildly, against the 49ers. And this number has ballooned out through the key of a field goal out to three-and-a-half. Total on this game, 51-and-a-half. The big news early in the week, Mike McCarthy, head coach of the Dallas Cowboys, requiring emergency surgery for appendicitis expects to coach this weekend and found that Dan Quinn's comment to be one of the best. You think that tough Irishman is going to miss this game? We certainly expect him to be rocking by game day. It does impact some of the game prep. So we'll see exactly what uh, Schottenheimer and company can put together. Some ridiculous comments being made by NFL media in regards to the Eagles. Uh, David Carr saying that the Eagles should consider playing Marcus Mariota and rest Jalen Hurts down the stretch as he continues to deal with a banged up knee. The Eagles won the first meeting between these teams 28 to 23 it was the Cowboys with a first down inside the 10 yard line with 27 seconds to go came up short did win the yardage battle 406 to 292 and the Cowboys had three scoreless fourth quarter drives inside that Philadelphia green zone when we look at the Eagles they haven't beaten the Cowboys in Dallas since 2017 however the big glaring hole on the Cowboys resume they're one of two teams since 2000 with nine plus wins through week 13 with zero victories against teams with winning records. The other team pain right in your backyard, the current iteration of the 2023 Miami Dolphins. Dak Prescott, though, has fared extremely well against the division. We'll see if some of that can continue. And the Cowboys have lined people's wallets going 31-14 and 14 ATS since the start of the 2021 season. The Eagles, meanwhile, have gone over the total in seven of eight divisional games, and they have been outstanding under the bright lights, 5-0 and straight up, 4-0-1 ATS. Payne, when we look at the Eagles' loss against the 49ers, we can say it was a byproduct of schedule we can say they were flirting with disaster but what were some of the main things that stuck out in the way that San Francisco completely dismantled that Philadelphia defense everything we said right I mean where do you want to attack these guys you want to attack them over the middle of the field Debo Samuel did that Kittle was involved to some extent Um, I mean it's just it's a vulnerable defense right now um that's that's primarily been the issues. They're trying to address it, right? I mean, they went out and they, they traded for Bayard. You go in and implement Shaq Leonard, who you signed this week. I, for me, I think if, you, if you're looking at the ways to attack this defense, it's very much the same this week for the Cowboys. I, I do believe there's a little bit more pressure on McCarthy and Dak, right? This is, this is a task that they haven't quite been able to to get over in these big, big spots. I think if you look at this run of success for the Cowboys offense, like, yes, there has been schematic change, right? Material change in in philosophy and thought process. One we called for, right? Gobs of of first down passing, pushing the ball further downfield with Dak, running Dak more in short yardage and in the red zone. All of the, you know, offensive efficiency cheat codes have, have been implemented you know, since the buy for Dallas. And that's great. In saying all of that, the average efficiency rank of the defense is Dallas and Mike McCarthy have faced the last seven weeks. Not good, Bob. 20, 26th. So, you know, it, it, you mentioned McCarthy being away from the team. He's going to be away for a couple of days this week with, with the appendectomy. So I, I think it's vital. The Eagles put pressure on the Cowboys offense. 
right, by, by getting out and scoring some of their own. Dallas has been far too comfortable calling its plays because they're not being threatened from a negative game state. You always want to force McCarthy into throwing up on himself. And so this, to me, is should be, for Dallas's offense, a one-dimensional attack. The run game still hasn't found its way, right? 19th in rush efficiency against the second easiest schedule of defenses in the NFL. So this is very much got to be on Dak in the throw game the Cowboys have done a fantastic job recently moving CD Lamb around so defenses can't key on them and and like we've kind of said for a couple weeks right the Eagles defense you really want to target that middle so Lamb in the slot you know Brandon Cooks is starting to emerge someone we thought would as he got a little bit healthier Jake Ferguson has really come on I mean he's just a matchup nightmare far more athletic than I think people think so we saw that on display against Seattle last week got to get him more involved especially in this matchup but I am interested to see what this looks like moving forward as I mentioned right you you went out and you got Kevin Byard now he's starting to get fully implemented the Eagles signed Shaq Leonard earlier this week to fix the linebacker position first four years of his career Shaq Leonard was you know, the linebacker last two seasons been kind of rife with injuries. Can he kind of get back in that, that, that groove a little bit here? If he does, it's just a massive, massive upgrade for the Eagles in the middle of the defense. I think the question becomes like, can the Cowboys continue hiking up their rate of first down and early down passes and do it in a sophisticated manner that doesn't look the same as the most recent Eagles meeting to where, Philly can't key on certain things, right? We saw Dallas in the first meeting. They're probably a little too run heavy on first down in the first half. And and those runs generated negative 0.3 EPA per rush with a long of three yards. The Eagles defense is very much a pass funnel and you need to treat them as such. And so I think you know the style of play here is, is very important. The Cowboys have to get out. You got to make Mike McCarthy comfortable as a play caller. You got to attack the areas of the defense where the Eagles are most vulnerable, and that's over the middle. You got to prove that that Byard and Shaq Leonard are are going to change that defense substantially. But uh, this one this one becomes interesting, especially if the Eagles do a couple different things offensively this week. Well, you mentioned the Eagles offensively, and I mean when you look at Jalen Hurts, he's registered a QBR of fifty four or lower in each of the last three games completion percentage each of the last two contests sub 60 percent I mean nothing alarming in terms of his actual completion percentage compared to completion percentage uh, over expectation but at the same time anyone who watches this Eagles offense can't be brimming with confidence because the fluidity that we saw last year when they played from a positive game script is gone some of that it I was going to say, I don't know if it's intensity, urgency, probably the better adjective for the way they look in the second half compared to early in these football games. And this is a Cowboys defense pain that Deron Bland could grab all sorts of headlines for pick six, pick sixes, but he was an absolute liability last week in coverage uh, against DK Metcalf and AJ Brown, you have to imagine, is intrigued by the opportunity that could exist on the outside. Philadelphia offensively against the Cowboys defense, the Eagles should have a path to success the question remains how aggressive will they be in terms of attacking Dallas at their most vulnerable yeah I mean you mentioned earlier about David Carr's comments and while ridiculous I think he's seeing some things that that we've spotted right I mean the Eagles talent is just so ridiculous that they're grinding their way to offensive efficiency And there's far less discussion about the Eagles decline offensively than, say, like the Chiefs, even though you just look at the two and schedule adjusted efficiency and the Chiefs rank better. And I've I've talked to you, you know, a few times off air and via text and a few other guys now for, you know, I would say three, four weeks. The Eagles offense feels extremely lethargic. Right? They're just sucking the life out of the game early on. Everything is so slow operating from the pace, which is 26th in the first half. Last season, it was the fastest first half pace the Eagles had. Getting plays in are slow. Getting out of the huddle is taken forever. Jalen Hurts is just so casual in his drop back. He's holding on to the ball forever, nearly half a second longer than last season. And so you'd think if you're holding on to the ball longer, you're stressing the defense further down the field, but that hasn't been the case. So you start to look at like early downs in the first half, 
two fewer air yards per pass attempt. 39% of pass attempts in the first half, Hertz is holding on to the ball for three plus seconds. Hertz is getting pressured at a significantly higher rate on early downs year over year. I don't know how effective Dallas Goddard will be, but the Eagles aren't really stressing teams over the middle of the field this season. And they're seeing a lot more cover too. They're seeing a lot more zone coverage. Jalen Hurts has not been as good this season against that. You see secondaries, they're cheating wide, they're cheating deep because there's not really a threat past the two receivers in the throw game. And so hopefully Quez, who returned last week and got involved in the game a little bit and Goddard will help some of those problem areas but there needs to be a fundamental shift for Philadelphia this week getting plays in faster going no huddle getting the ball out of Hurts hands quicker throwing to all areas of the field with you know pass pass catching weapons much healthier and if that happens you know three and a half is probably too large of a number AJ Brown came out this week in his presser and said we understand the problem we know what we need to do I know the Eagles have been made privy of some of their issues, so let's see if if there's fundamental change. If there is, Dallas can be exposed because it's a very much a, a boom or bust defense. To your point, when just you know mentioning one singular fellow in in, in Deron Bland, so there are there are certainly areas to attack. You want to also attack the Cowboys over the middle of the field. They just don't have the pieces to do that. Now again, Quez Watkins returns, awesome. Dallas Goddard. He says he's going to play. I don't know what that injury looks like. Can he protect himself when he falls? I, I don't know. So I don't know the type of game plan or involvement that, that's going to be there for Dallas Goddard. But I, you'd like to see A.J. Brown moved around a little bit more. right? We just talked about the things Mike McCarthy's doing with C.D. Lamb. Why don't we get A.J. Brown, a big physical receiver, lining up in the slot and, and on some crossers? I We just haven't seen it. So I think what the Eagles offense needs to do is just stop pressing so much, stop thinking so much, and just get back to what you were doing. Get the plays in quicker. Start going no huddle a little bit. Get Jalen Hurts releasing the ball quicker. And I think you'll start to see improvements just by just by doing those little things. I really believe that. When you look at the schedule, uh, you mentioned it last week. The Eagles were playing their third game in 13 days before they took on the 49ers. Here the Eagles are, a full week of rest, but the Cowboys get a rest advantage against the Eagles. They had the mini buy playing back-to-back Thursday games. We'll see Philadelphia get a little bit more rest, although they're traveling to the West Coast against the Seahawks next Monday. I mean, how does that play into it, or does the Philadelphia loss against the 49ers immediately get this team refocused, knowing what's at stake? Because if they win on Sunday, night they put a nail in the Cowboys coffin in terms of their aspirations to be a division champion yeah I mean it's a it's a gauntlet of a schedule and we kind of saw that last week where hey the Eagles kind of came out pretty hot there and then they just died down the stretch now were you surprised the Eagles had their starters out there as long as they did I was a little surprised by that yeah now you obviously have a big division game on deck that refocuses you and you probably feel like you got a little fortunate. But I think we've seen some some battle in the market, right? I mean, guys who were, were betting the look ahead wanted wanted Dallas. Now that we've gotten to three and a half, you know, there's there's at least been some some sentiment from my guys to at least take a gander at the Eagles. Yep. I think if you get the Eagles in their current iteration, right, offensively, and they're just gonna get plays in in slow and you know, Jalen Hurts is just gonna methodically drop back and hold on to the ball forever you know Dallas probably wins and covers this thing if you start getting back to some of the the old Eagles way and and just upping your tempo and being aggressive and getting the ball out of Jalen Hurts hands quicker what you want to do against uh, you know a Cowboys pass rush like this I think there's opportunity I really do believe that so um you know we saw this total get hit over by like the sharpest of sharpest groups, multiple groups going over 51. Once we got to 53 and then the Mike McCarthy news trickles down and you start to think about what totals have been like in the year 2023, it's difficult. If you just rewind it and and talked about this game in these two teams and it, you placed it in like a 2020 COVID setting where there were no fans in the stands 55 and a half. or even 20, right? 55 and a half. Yeah. So like that's that's the battle that that pros are going through this season and that like 
if you just look at these two teams and you put them in like a 2020 setting, the totals 55 and a half, it's probably getting there. <laughs> it, just, it, just, it just hasn't happened in the 2023 setting. So I'm intrigued to see how this game goes. But if again, just I mean, you don't want to keep repeating yourself, but if Philadelphia does the right things early in this game with tempo, I it's tough to want to go under a 51 and a half right now. It, may, um, it makes you know. makes plenty of sense. Uh, and a bookend for the Thursday night game versus Sunday night where we have a three touchdown differential there. And I know a lot of our listeners waiting with bated breath. Yes, before we finish recording, we're starting to see 29 and a half at the sharpest shops for the Thursday night showdown between the Steelers and Patriots. You can only hope that Al Michaels didn't look at the total before he's got to broadcast this game because he may not bring that energy and enthusiasm knowing that a 17-13 game could be a tall mountain to climb to kick things he's up. definitely referencing it oh there's no doubt about sure. it I- i'm wondering if he references it in the lead up to the game before we even see toe meat leather and things kick off if he talks about how low this total actually is i'm kind of hoping he does i would i would think so i would think so yeah he's uh He's a man who likes to sweat. Let's put it that way. <laughs> he is in tune with what goes on in faraway places or not so far away as the case may be here in 2023. You can follow Payne on social media at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there. Most importantly, for all things Bet the Board, be sure to follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. And uh, we mentioned putting together a little bit of a winning streak uh, on the best bet portion of the program. Uh, what have we found for week 14 to get our loyal listeners right back to the window? I was hoping that the weather remained horrific because, you know, you get a little bit of, uh, you know, a pocket statue in golf and a mobile quarterback in fields. But I still think there's there's some value here at three and a half. I know this is a game you and I have, have both bet already this week. Uh, let's go with rotation number one one zero, the Chicago Bears plus the three and a half. And again, I just I think when you look at Eberflus, when you look at Fields, both are playing for their jobs. And I like what they're doing defensively. We talked about how good the run defense has been all season, trending even better. So I think you remove a bit of the Lions run game here. Frank Ragnow, large question mark up front for the Lions offensive line. We know what golf has looked like over the years in this specific stadium when there is weather. Uh, still supposed to be a little bit of wind, although it's it subsided a bit. But I just think when you look at the way both of these teams are trending, you get the much better defense with the mobile quarterback versus the pocket statue who struggled in these settings. Um, the Bears went into Detroit into a perfect Lions setting and were up 12 late in that game and, and pissed it away. You start to look at the Lions maybe getting a little bit too much respect for last week's win. They get up 21 nothing. Sure, great opening drive, and then it was turnover, short field, turnover, short field, touchdown. But from that point forward, the Saints team, which I don't really like and think is very good, managed to outplay the Lions the rest of the way. And so you're getting credit for last week's win and cover, but it just it wasn't all that impressive to me the final three quarters. And so I think there's some value here on the Bears. Again, we both bet it. Let's take the three and a half there. The other one we discussed a little bit, I know there's no college podcast this week because it's only Army-Navy on the schedule. But mentioned the Ravens being one of my uh, favorite advantage teasers this week. We also broke down the Bills game. I think there's some advantages there for the Bills offense. Those games have been back and forth, tightly contested. So uh, second best bet, let's go Ravens to Bills, two-team six-point teaser. You can get the Ravens at most spots down to minus one. I think that's smart because we're trending at some shops to seven and a half. So you're kind of getting that added value there um, with, with you know, I would say 30% of the shops at at seven and a half, 70% of the shops at, at seven. So you get a little bit more value there if it's going to close seven and a half, eight, which I, I think it probably does. And then you pair it to the Buffalo Bills, get them above the three and the seven. You can pair those at 
at places that uh, our listeners have frequented over the years, uh, plus eight. Yep. So second best bet, you get the Ravens down to one. You get the Bills up to plus eight in the teaser. So two best bets this week for us. I like it, my friend. Uh, let's keep things rolling down the track. Still a lot of ground uh, to cover for the NFL season before we get into the culmination of the regular season and the playoff run two best bets to keep our listeners fully engaged and entrenched this upcoming weekend. Uh, Any final words of advice, parting shots, things you'd like to share with our listenership this fine Thursday? That's everything, man. Let's get out of Dodge. All right. Let's have a good week. Let's keep the momentum rolling here. Let's do it. Best of luck to all of you guys and girls out there. Thanks as always for tuning into the Bet the Board podcast. Be sure, sure to share with your friends, family, colleagues, everybody else who's looking to keep themselves entertained throughout this holiday season. We know nobody works during the month of December, so this should be must listen in every office across this fine country. And most importantly, with a Chicago Bears ticket and an advantage teaser in hand, come Sunday afternoon, We'll see you at the window. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Bet the Board. Make sure you follow Todd and Payne on X. Todd is at Todd Furman. That's T-O-D-D-F-U-H-R-M-A-N. And Payne is at Payne Insider. That's P-A-Y-N-E-I-N-S-I-D-E-R. Don't forget, our weekly newsletter comes with an additional best bet. Have that delivered to your inbox by clicking the link atop the podcast show notes. And most importantly, subscribe and download Bet the Board. We're on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Wondery, YouTube, Google Podcasts, and all your other major platforms.